Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in today to the KTH 910 AM Interview of the Week here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. My name is Dave Palmer. Diane Xavier is our producer running the board. I appreciate her help with this. And thank you for listening. Uh, this is a program where we like to talk about things that are Catholic. Most of them are, are local, and uh, it, I typically say if it's Catholic in North Texas, then it's fair game. And this interview today has a North Texas angle <laughs> in the sense that uh, the gentleman who I'm going to interview is the brother of uh, a friend and somebody you may have heard of, Kevin Fitzpatrick with Heroic Media. And I was contacted by Kevin's brother, Danny, recently, who said that he has uh, written a novel that is about to be uh, published, released this year. And it just sounded like a really intriguing novel and has Catholic themes and a uh, story of his own uh, life experience back at Hurric- with Hurricane Katrina. And I said, let's do it. This sounds like a lot of fun. The book is called Only the Lover Sings. And as I mentioned, his name is Danny Fitzpatrick. And uh, he joins us now for the program. Danny, good afternoon. How are you doing? Dave, I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and I understand this is your first interview about the book, which makes me feel so special that uh, I got the first shot at you. I'm sure it's going to be the first of many, but <laughs> uh, but anyways, that, that's going to be great. Tell me about yourself. Uh, you and you and uh, Kevin are the only uh, two uh, children in your family. You grew up in New Orleans. You're about a year and a half older than him. Uh, tell us about your family and, and growing up in New Orleans before we get into the the theme and everything that went on back in 2005 with this hurricane. Sure, sure. Yeah, so Kevin and I, uh, as you said, grew up in New Orleans. Um, Our parents are deeply Catholic people, um, you know, really, really imbued me and Kevin with a sense of the importance of our faith. And New Orleans, of course, is such a Catholic city. You know, there are all these beautiful churches all around. Um, We went to Immaculate Conception, uh, or the, the Jesuit church there in downtown New Orleans, and uh, so Catholicism was really always an important part of our lives. Um, Kevin and I then both went to the University of Dallas, which is how Kevin ended up there in North Texas. Yeah. Um, after that, I went back to New Orleans and went back to Jesuit High School, where I had been a student, and taught English and theology there for three years. Um, then my wife Grace and I moved up here to Hot Springs, Arkansas, um, we had our, our first daughter, uh, Therese, in the spring of 2016, so then we moved up here so we could be a little bit closer to Grace's family, and yeah. here we are. Um, yeah, so take us back. It's hard to believe that uh, Hurricane Katrina was uh, 14 years ago. It seems like it was yesterday, but you know, growing up in New Orleans, uh, you're a, a teenager. Uh, tell us about the, the, what that because this this um, book has to do with your experience and your family's experience of Hurricane Katrina, Category 5 hurricane made landfall Florida and, and Louisiana back in August of 2005, catastrophic damage. I think anybody who's, you know, old enough remembers that because it was a huge, huge story. But tell us uh, what life was like before and also as that storm was approaching for you. Sure. Yeah. So of course we've got all this flooding going on in Arkansas right now, more in the more in the western part of the state, but also coming into Little Rock. Um, And I was talking with someone about that yesterday, and just uh, discussing how back before Katrina, and to some extent even now, um, hurricanes were were really almost these sort of celebrated events Mm -hmm. when I was growing up. You know, there's this excitement about you know, we're going to be off school and our parents are going to be off work and we might get to evacuate and hang out with our cousins, you know, on this big evacuation party. Um, And of course that, you know, there's a sort of sense of uh, rejoicing um, in getting out of the ordinary. um, And then also a sense of complacence as well, which of course was was tragic for for many people who didn't evacuate at the time of Katrina. Um, And of course, you know, it, it, really changed the way that people people looked at storms you know going forward since then um you know i don't think as many people are are as willing just to, to chant it with the levees anymore um but yeah it was uh it was a really stunning time my family lived and and still lives in a part of new orleans called lakeview mm-hmm. which is just south of lake Pontchartrain. our house is about a mile from the spot where the 17th street canal levee burst wow um, so we had we had about eight feet of water in our house for for two or three weeks, and uh, you know spent the next year you know kind of kind of moving all around the south, you know first in Dallas, then in Houston, 
then for quite a few months on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, you know, while we were gutting the house completely, you know, tearing it down to the studs and then renovating eventually, we moved back in. I think it was one year and one month after Katrina initially made landfall. Yeah. And, you know, the obviously everybody who lived through this storm, every family has a story and everything is unique and special to that uh, particular family. What, uh, what inspired you to take your personal story? Because I know this book, uh, Only the Lover Sings, is a bit autobiographical. How, when, when did you decide to, to put this to, you know, into a book form? Well, it started to some degree when I was a student at the University of Dallas, Um, In the fall of my sophomore year, um, I took the the Literary Traditions 4 class, which deals with prose fiction. And one of the elements of that class is that uh, everyone is asked to write a short story. So, you know, sort of casting about for material, um, I went back to Katrina, and I wrote a story about my relationship with my best friend growing up. Um, It was uh, my friend Bobby, who grew up two blocks away from me. Um, and it was really curious after the storm, he and I remained best, remained best friends and you know, we're still good friends to this day. Um, we went different paths as far as our faith mm-hmm. after the storm. Um, so I, it was sort of a catalyst for me to embrace my faith a little bit more as something of my own rather than just as kind of a passive heritage. Um, whereas for my friend, you know, in the wake of the storm, you know, he, he moved, moved away to agnosticism and then atheism afterwards. And uh, that was really heartbreaking for me. Um, and so I kind of, I wrote this short story about that experience. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time talking to Dr. Greg Roper there at UD um, about the, about the process of writing a story and about uh, the idea of, you know, maybe eventually writing more stories about growing up in New Orleans and about that experience of Katrina. And so slowly, I just kind of kept that in the back of my head um, until about 2016 when I decided to, you know, take that first story and kind of turn it into, you know, a full-scale novel. Yeah. The book is called Only the Lover Sings. The author is Danny Fitzpatrick, and uh, we're talking about this. has to do with his and his family's experience and his uh, friend Bobby also, uh, August 2005, when Hurricane Katrina, Category 5, Hurricane hit New Orleans, we all remember it, while eight feet of water in your house for weeks. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, Catholic novelist Michael O'Brien has endorsed the book and has a beautiful endorsement. And uh, he talks about, Danny, you're groping for understanding of how to deal with the collapse of security and with his parents' wounds and the ancestral inheritance of psyche and culture on both sides of his family. So really the the book has to do more with just your relationship with Bobby, your friend, and his, you know, like you say, going different directions. What are some of the other plots and sub-themes that come out in the book? Sure. So so one thing that I was interested in is, of course, the main narrative takes place from, you know, a, about August until Thanksgiving of, uh, you know, sort of metaphorically 2005 there there are never any dates or names of storms or anything like that given yeah. um, with the idea being that you know theoretically this could happen at any time in any place um of course it has a new orleans flair to it um but i, I tried to keep it a little bit separate from katrina itself mm-hmm. um but i was really interested in the way that grace sort of moves in a person's life um and so in addition to that kind of central narrative of, of my family moving all about the South and trying to figure out a way to come back home. And the, of course the struggles, you know, especially, uh, you know, from my, my parents' perspective of how do you maintain a sort of a normal life when everything has been taken away from you? Yeah. Um, it's sort of interspersed. The beginning of each chapter has a little scene that's taken from a different part of the main character Roman's life. Mm-hmm. Um, so we get all these little these little snippets of actions of, of grace in Roman's life to get a sense of why is it that when this particular tragedy of the hurricane struck, what what was it that moved him towards God yeah. rather than away? 
And so we're trying to, you know, get a sense of how is it that how is it that grace acts over the whole course of a person's life, you know, guiding them, guiding them to God, and guiding them also to uh, to sing about their love of God um, and the love that that inspires for for others, for friends and family. Yeah. So ultimately, it sounds like, as you say, this is a book about how God works in people's lives in the midst of catastrophe. And was that one of the intentions? Because every you know everybody has you know, to some degree or another, some hardship and catastrophe in their life, the loss of a loved one. It may not be a hurricane. It may not be a storm. Was that one of your intentions is just to provide hope for people that God's grace works even in the midst of uh, devastating uh, circumstances? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think part of it too was to to try to bring home something that I found very curious in my experience of Katrina is that I really had a sense before the storm happened that this one was going to be different from the others. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that was, but you know, there's a real sense of, it seems like we are about to actually lose everything. Yeah. You know, whereas in the past there's kind of this vague idea of, well, theoretically we could, but I don't think it's going to happen. And so I kept waiting and waiting for a feeling of loss. You know, once our, you know, hearing the news that the the levees had, had been breached, uh, watching our, our neighborhood fill up with water. I kept waiting for the sense of loss. I was like, when am I going to feel sad about this? Yeah. And oddly enough, uh, I kind of felt, felt this sense of uh, rejuvenation, the sense of being you know, separated from kind of the, the, the boring daily rut of things. Um, but what I found was then, of course, you know, as my friend lost his faith, that's where I felt the real agony of yeah. loss. And so something I was trying to get at in the book is that everyone, of course, has, you know, material hardships, um, physical suffering, uh, you know, loss of material things that they deal with, I think, at some point or other in their lives. Yeah. Um, but what we're what I think unites us even more is that all of us are in this struggle for our souls. Yeah. Um, and we've got God moving out, trying to. Uh, trying to guide us back to him. Um, and we have this, you know, we have this sort of imminence of the eschaton where, where all of us, um, you know, are going to experience, uh, you know, our own personal apocalypse, our yeah. own, you know, unveiling at our deaths where, you know, we're going to go one way or another. And so I think that the agony that I felt, you know, when, when my friend lost his faith, was that that sense of agony of like here's the real loss yeah that there's a soul in jeopardy here and not just any soul but but the soul of of my best friend right which and in many ways I is even yeah more important than the the physical destruction or the yeah. loss of homes or levees and yeah that that's that's really interesting yeah um absolutely Danny, let me ask, uh, one of the comments that Michael O'Brien uh, made in his uh, endorsement and review of your book is he, he called the book a, a living metaphor of the devastating spiritual flood that has swept through once Christian civilization. And I know we kind of touched on that with the loss of faith of your friend. Um, t tell us more about that. How is this book, even though it has to do with you know one particular person's life story, uh, how, how does it... Um, kind of deal with the overall state of the, the, the church and Christianity in today's culture. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think of course the primary way that that is brought to the forefront in the book um, is in the, is in the, you know, sort of spiritual struggle that, uh, that the character Francis in the book goes through. Um, but of, of course it's kind of all around. Um, one thing that, one thing that Roman is very attuned to, is uh, people's language yeah. throughout the book. Um, he he's very attuned to, you know, when when people curse. Um, he's very attuned to uh, the nuances of speech that can indicate, you know, uh, anger um, or or other emotions. And it's, you know, I think that's one thing that that Roman as a character really notices is there's a there's a loss of respect for God in the very way that we speak. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, if, if, if Christ is the word, um, then there's a sense that our words are a participation in the life of Christ and that the farther we move away from goodness in our speech, 
um, you know, the farther away we move from, from our real humanity as participation in the life of the Word. Yes, amen. The book is called Only the Lover Sings. The author is Danny Fitzpatrick. Uh, I'm curious about the title. Where, where did that come from, Only the Lover Sings? Yes. Um, so, so I borrowed it uh, from, well, indirectly from St. Augustine uh, through Joseph Pieper. Yeah. Um, Joseph Pieper has, has a book also titled Only the Lover Sings, um, you know, which, is, which is a phrase that he got from, uh, from St. Augustine. Um, and Pieper's book is basically a reflection on contemplation and art, yeah. um, which is a, a big element of, of my book is the idea that, um, so the book, it actually starts with a little, with a little um, introduction where Roman and Francis meet, but uh, several years after the events of, of the storm. Mm. Um, and so there's, a, there's the idea that the book, the main body of the book as a whole, is Roman's attempt artistically to sh- to present his love for Francis as well as his love for God. Yeah. And so there's this sense that um, the more time that you spend uh, contemplating God's love, the more likely you are to you know sort of burst out into song. Uh, yeah. You know the the way of course that of course you know uh, there's nothing more common in in music than a love song. Yeah. Um, and I think that can apply very well to to any kind of art. Um, that there's, you know, not only do we do we participate in the life of the word through our our individual words, but there's a way where, when we take up uh, and, and inform those words with a specific artistic vision, that's very close in a way to, uh, you know, God's creative work where He takes you know, the formless wasteland yeah. um, and puts, you know, all of the different uh, forms of of life and existence that we see around us. Very nice. Uh, one more question, then I want uh, you to let everybody know when it's going to be published and how they can get it. Danny Fitzpatrick is my guest. Only the lover sings. I like that. Uh, so Peeper stole it from Augustine, and then you stole it from Peeper, right? So fair, fair. fair. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned to me uh, in an email that you had you were hoping to contribute to the revitalization of Catholic fiction. Tell me about that. Where where is Catholic fiction in your estimation now, and how how do you hope to contribute to that? Sure, sure. Well, so I mean, I think in short, Catholic fiction is to some degree struggling right yeah. now. You know, it's kind of odd. You look at the the you know m- much really of the 20th century, and you've got these these really heavy hitters as far as Catholic fiction goes. Yeah. You know, you've got Walker Percy and Flannery O'Connor and Evelyn Waugh, um, and then you know, it just sort of, sort of peters out. Um, and now, of course, we do have some some really good things going on right now. Michael O'Brien, of course, um, is is probably, I would say, at the forefront of Catholic fiction. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at like Ignatius Press authors, you know, he's kind of right up there at the mm-hmm. top. Um, but I think there's the sense that Catholic fiction is now sort of segregated. From the rest of fiction, yeah. Um, you know, whereas folks like Evelyn Wall or Walker Percy, um, you know, were at least in my perception much more a part of the mainstream literary conversation. Mm-hmm. There's now a sense that we're we're more on the outside. Yeah. Um, and so I think I think there are a couple things that I'm trying to do to sort of get us back more into the main conversation. Um, one is to focus a little bit more on kind of as I put it before the the imminence of the eschaton. Mm-hmm. So when we look at a lot of Catholic fiction today, there it, it's very apocalyptic. Yeah. Um, and of course, Walker Percy uh, gets into that as well, but in a little bit more outlandish way, I think. So I'm trying to look a little bit more at just how is how does the everyday person experience the apocalypse in his everyday life, right. apart from any you know particular grand uh, apocalyptic event. Um, but then I'm also trying to return to myth. Um, so if you look at if you look at a lot of the great writers of the 20th century, um, not even specifically Catholic ones, but folks like uh, James Joyce or William Faulkner, um, they constantly have in mind the grand literary tradition. Um, you know, you know, Joyce, of course, you know, in Ulysses, you know, is constantly looking at the Odyssey. Um, so what I had in mind with this book 
was to basically make it a meditation in some respect on the Genesis 1 creation narrative. So you'll notice the book is divided into seven chapters, yeah. and the central images of each chapter are meant to reflect the corresponding day uh, in the Genesis 1 creation mm. story. Um, so I think that a return to myth you know, as kind of these forms by which we connect to the grand arc of human experience. Yeah. Well, so there's a great um, it, organization. A us, yeah. Right, I'm, right. Cur- I'm curious. I, I told you that was going to be the last question, but another one popped into my mind now. Uh, sure. Of all the authors that you mentioned, uh, even, you know, you're talking about 20th century, you have not yet mentioned Chesterton, Tolkien, and well, C.S. Lewis was almost Catholic. <laughs> he was, uh, sure. but uh, do, do these, these are the three big heavyweights. And of course, the other ones you mentioned are big as well. Uh, right. Have those also had an influence on you, those, those authors? They have. They have, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think they're more, maybe I don't mention them as much because they're, they're almost a little bit closer to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course, the, you know, the Narnia books, um, you know, were, were great friends during my childhood. And actually, um, during the time of Katrina, I was reading the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, that, that's all there. Um, you know, I think maybe maybe the other ones I mentioned were were more because I think of them as strictly uh, strictly fiction yeah. authors. Um, you know, whereas I look at at Tolkien and and Chesterton and Lewis, and and they're kind of just these you know all around uh, giants, you know, yeah. just, just towering over over everything kind of there in the background. Right, right. And I'm glad you mentioned some of those other authors, because everybody knows Chesterton, Tolkien, and Lewis, but uh, to mention some of these other, of course, you know, Waugh and Flannery O'Connor are not exactly, uh, you know, um, small names, but all right. Well, hey, uh, Danny, great talking with you, and I just want to remind everybody, Danny Fitzpatrick is my guest, and only the lover sings. I think it just sounds like a, a really... Uh, really thought-provoking, well-organized, and interesting novel that he's written. Uh, when can people get it? Can they pre-order? And, uh, you know, what, what should they do if they're interested in, in purchasing a copy? Sure, sure. So um, the first thing I recommend is uh, for folks to follow me on Instagram at dsfits1035. That's dsfitz1035. The publisher, uh, which is En Route Books and Media, and I are still in the process of, of deciding a firm publication date. Um, we had initially talked about toward the end of August to coincide with the anniversary of Katrina and also the Feast of St. Augustine. Um, I think we're looking at a little bit later in the fall now, um, but we should, you know, it should be out this year. Um, it'll be available you know, through Amazon, um, through the En Route Books and Media website. Um, I think Barnes & Noble, uh, you'll be able to get it through their website as well. Um, so most of the major online retailers, um, you, know, you can also order directly from me. And uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is that um, Enroute and I are going to be hosting a cover art contest. Um, it's going to be launched initially through uh, some, some sacred artists in, in Italy, and then we're going to bring it over uh, to the U.S., but there will be uh, basically a contest for cover art design. Um, and the winner will will receive publication on the cover of the, cover of the novel, um, as well as a uh, small monetary prize. And then the two runners up will receive monetary prizes as well. Mm. Um, so again, if you follow me on Instagram uh, or on Facebook, you can get more information about that contest and the release date of the novel coming up soon. Oh, that, that's exciting. So DS Fitz 1035, D as in uh, DS Fitz, F-I-T-Z 1035, on Instagram and also on uh, Facebook, they can find you as well. That's right? That's right. Okay. Wow. That's interesting, Danny. Thank- Congratulations on the almost uh, publication of this book, Only the Lover Sings. It sounds fascinating, and I thank Danny Fitzpatrick for being on the air with us. And, uh, again, uh, get uh, in touch with him. And if you're an artist, maybe you can get involved in that contest to, to have your art on the cover of the book. Uh, this has been the interview of the week here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Diane Xavier, for producing and running the board for this program. And 
uh, you know, Danny reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I'd like to do an interview, and I appreciate that he did. And we all learned a lot about uh, this great book and the uh, situation of at least one family and one individual from Hurricane Katrina. If you have any suggestions for this show, uh, email me, Dave Palmer at grnonline.com. Thanks for listening, and God bless you.